Good afternoon, everyone. So today, with us, we have Narayan Amit. He secured All India Rank 70 this year, but more importantly for you people, for anthropology students, he has scored highest marks in anthropology optional this year. He secured, he got 307 marks. And for people who are repeating their exams, who are not able to consistently do well in mains examination, he's also someone who increased his marks drastically. In his previous attempt, that was his first attempt, he secured, uh, he, he got 257 marks, but in this attempt, that is uh, this year, he increased it by 50 marks. So for some of you who are like, sir, I'm stuck at 250 for long now, <laughs> in two attempts, three attempts, I've faced the, uh, this issue, you can ask all your doubts from him. Uh, now, uh, b before, before uh, starting his preparation for civil services, he graduated from IIT Kanpur, and very recently in 2020, so he is someone who, while he was in college, had started preparing, gave his very first attempt there, got good marks, 257 was also very good marks, but then, after putting some efforts, was able to do much better, come to 307. Okay, so ask as many doubts as you want, pura khun pilo, jitna available hai, and try that next year, you go as his junior in the academy. Okay, so Narayan, the stage is all yours, thank you. So a very good afternoon to all who are present today. I'm very thankful for Level Up IAS for giving me this opportunity uh, to share my insights on anthropology and I hope that these insights might be useful to you. I think one of the unique things about anthropology is that in the last five, six years, almost all the toppers from Koyashi Harsha to Ashima Mittal to Varnit Negi to Akshat Jain to Shubham Kumar to Ishan Jaiswal and others also, many others also. They have actually uh, helped other aspirants by uploading their notes, their answer copies, and also their approach to the exam. And I think that students of anthropology must appreciate this because I have seen that in other options this is not the case, wherein one person builds on the knowledge of the other. So the reason for the good performance of anthropology in the last six years is that each topper is taking his own sense of social responsibility and helping other aspirant community. So in that direction, I also think that whatever uh, bits, especially in spe specific and particular areas I can add, Definitely, I will provide you with that knowledge, and I hope that it will also help you increase your marks. It will also help you increase your marks a bit. So I'll just, uh, this is a very general talk. It's not going to be too much specific about book list. Actually, the question of book list is not much relevant now because almost all the toppers have uploaded their notes, their answer copy of the book list. There is no secret actually now. In Kung Fu Panda movie, I think that the panda is trying for the scroll, but actually there is no secret. So actually there is no secret, what all books that are there in the market, they are very well known. What all resources you have to follow are very well known. So now it is a question of how much you are able to do the validation of the notes and how you are able to uh, improve the quality of your answers before the exam. Because anthropology is a subject which requires hard work before the exam rather than thinking in the exam. So actually both my papers, I was very actually very uh, pleasant and very non-tense in the paper. I wrote them very coolly and I had even 3-4 uh, minutes to spare also. So if you do the hard work before the battle, then you can bleed less in the war and you can get very good marks. It's a very nice subject, anthropology, and I also liked it a lot. So now I'll get into the talk. But firstly, I'll say that you, all of us should uh, at least watch one topper talk every fortnight. That is, one, every 14 days, at least one topper talk you can watch and you can learn one or two insights from each other topper talk and you can uh, definitely read them. I think I watched over uh, 50 topper talks. I think I watched at least 50 topper talks and I used to keep on watching them regularly. The thing is that once you watch a topper talk, it is not easy to digest the content in one go. So whenever you are redoing the topic, just go to all the topper talks and you see what topic they have inside. For example, someone might say that you have to put this diagram here or these are the keywords or the head subheadings that are there in the question. So in the first reading itself, you will not get a good idea of how to do that. So if you keep on watching them regularly, you can see. But some of the best ones I have found are that firstly, I think the father of our student community is Koya Shri Harsha. 
because he actually started this answer writing format. I will prepare my notes and then I will do the PYQs. I think it was started by him actually. I think he was in 2017. Then you can definitely watch Ashima Mittal's talk. Now, since I have got good marks, maybe I think I can add my name also to the list. But uh, so definitely, these are the top of talk all of us burst watch, and all of the insights they have given. Many of the my insights are also based on them only, and I watch them around 50 times. Maybe all of them, maybe more also. But if someone wants notes, I have found that the best notes among all of them is not by uh, these people, but another person. His name is Mandar Jain Patki. I think he was in 2019. And his notes are the best of all I have found. And I have also relied heavily on his notes. And uh, the entire game is that these people have given uploaded some notes, and they have covered the syllabus in their manner. Sure, sure. Sure. Hmm. So I think now you are able to see me clearly. So I think Mandar Jain Patki, his notes are the best in the market, and definitely you can rely on them. And uh, the entire game, what I mentioned was that you have to take the notes, and in some areas you can add one or two points, or you can add one or two flowcharts, or convert something, or use your own application of the mind, or you can add two, three th theoretical dimensions. So if you base your notes on them and then do the value addition and then you have to remember the notes, if you do that, definitely you will get a very good score. So, So I have also given a talk at L2A, and you can watch that also. In, in that, I have shared many insights in detail. So to avoid repetition, I will not share that. You can watch the talk at L2A. I have given a talk at L2A that is going to be uploaded in one or two days. And I have gone for more than two and a half hours on that. And I was also very tired after the talk. So I have mentioned many things there that also you can watch. So apart from that, what is the other insights I can provide, which is applicable to you? Definitely, I will give in this talk. So I'll just share what is my score in anthropology, and where did I improve, and what is the score you need for getting into the or top preferred service. So I think in 2020, and this is 2021, this would be paper one, this would be paper two. So my score in 2020 in paper one, in paper one which was actually very difficult, we all know that a lot of questions that were there, liminality, Natufian culture, total institutions, such kind of complex questions were asked in the last year. So it was a very tough paper. But uh, I could not do well in that paper, so I got 122. And paper 2, since it's a generalistic kind of paper, the uh, impact of technical aspects comes little less. And questions are very straightforward in paper 2. So as a consequence, I have found that in paper 2, the marking is actually less. In paper 1, for example, if highest is 170, in highest of paper 2 will be 150. That is because if a question is asked, what are the educational problems of tribes, almost everyone will write something or the other. But if it is asked, what are the traditions of the European Mesolithic, half of the, almost all of them will uh, write about Indian Mesolithic and just uh, try to uh, change a little bit here and there. But European Mesolithic is actually a very dedicated topic and there are nine traditions that you have to mention. So in paper one, like I say, you have to use your brain a lot, a lot of theoretical points. It takes 70% of the time. So paper one takes around 67% of the time. To prepare, this takes only 33% of the time to prepare. So my major energy was dedicated on paper. And as you can see in my score also, in first year it was 122, but in second year it was 166. So that is a plus 44 mark increase in paper. And this is a huge jump. And I think that is the singular reason for me getting rank of 70. My paper 2, uh, my score was good in both the years. So in the first year it was 135. And the second year, I was able to maintain that, and I got 140. So that is 306, and this is 257. So a difference of plus 49. So I think um, optional is the most important deciding rank factor. If you're not prepared with your optional before prelims, I think you should not enter the cycle, because you will get into sucked into the vicious cycle. Because if you only prefer for general studies before prelims, and you write the prelims exam, and you clear it also, then within three months, it is not possible to get this kind of score. 
getting 306 in any optional requires at least six months plus of dedicated hard work. Any option you take, it requires six months plus. If you only study for three or four months, you'll get this kind of score, 257, 260. Maybe slightly less also sometimes. So if you want to be in the top of the list, then definitely you need to put six months plus in optional to get this kind of score. One more thing uh, is that if you're not prepared with your optional before the uh, prelims exam, the issue becomes that you'll get this kind of score and you'll be getting a rank of around 300. Now at 300, you will not get your preferred service. You will get some service, but you will not get your preferred service. You will be in the bottom of the list. So again, you have to write that. So people who could clear this exam in one or two attempts, they take many attempts because of the nature of the uh, exam. It has a certain exam cycle. So that's why you should always be prepared before uh, the prelims with your optional. At, at least a major part of it should be completed. Then you can do your answer writing or uh, note making. Majorly should be completed, but if you want to add a little bit, you can add after a prelims exam also, but time is very less. And the stress comes in the main examination because in this three month period, most people are very stressed about what to do. So that effectiveness is a little less in this period. So I say for like in the, uh, in the UR uh, category, if you want to be in the list, means uh, we, without getting 260, I don't think there is a good chance of you being in the list also. So that is the 300 rank. If you want to be in the list, you need to get 260 plus. If you want to be assured of uh, like, uh, getting an uh, I IS or uh, IPS or IFS, what is your first difference? You need a score of 280 plus. If you are in the 280 plus bracket, then definitely any other mistake also is slightly covered. So I think anyone who is choosing anthropology must at least target 280 plus. Otherwise, it becomes very difficult to get your uh, top preferred service. Because general studies marking is much uh, stricter. And essay and ethics are slightly a bit of a gamble that you might get or you might not get. An interview, we all know it is more of a gamble than all of them. So at least you need 280 marks in optional. I got 306, so that is a 26 marks increase. And if I got less marks in slightly other aspects also, that is also covered. So I think I have highlighted the role optional pays. And I don't know what anyone tells, but I feel that the singular reason why you get any rank is your optional subject. Optional is the most important uh, game changer in the rank. People say this is a generalistic exam. Why do we have optional as game changer? Actually, before 2013, there were two optionals and they had double the weightage. So even though optional weightage has been reduced, still it remains the predominant factor that determines your rank. So first, optional is most important. If you don't do optional, then even if you do GS very well, you might get 415, 420. But if you get 214 optional, you will not be in the list. So uh, emphasizing on optional is most important. So I. Uh, if you want to see my notes or other strategies or some topics you can skip, which I have found after my analysis, some insights in the PYQ, I have created a channel where all my content I upload and the link of the channel is this. So this is a Telegram channel. And I'm getting a very good response, so I hope it is due to the content I'm putting. So where all I took coaching also, I'll tell that in a disclaimer, in the interest of transparency. So for my first attempt, I had not taken any uh, physical or online coaching. I had only taken one test series at L2A. And I had written only a few tests. But uh, since like I'm a person who can memorize a lot of stuff, and uh, for me, answer writing practice is not much important because I'm able to frame my answers very quickly. But content was uh, the big challenge for me. So in the first attempt, I took L2A test series. In my second attempt, uh, I took uh, online coaching at where ICS. And since sir allows anyone who is in the uh, batch for to take test series, I took test series also at him. And again, I took L2A test series, uh, this thing. So actually, I had not known about Karandeep sir till this point. And this was after I did the mains examination. But after my second mains examination also, then I thought that still I can do some validation in anthropology because nobody knows you're going to get 70th rank or some good score in anthropology. So I was still working on my validation because in my mind I was feeling that anthropology is the most important thing and even if I'm not successful in this attempt, even the next attempts also I have to focus on anthropology. So then I joined the DAMP program at Level Up IS. with Karandeep sir. And I found it to be a good program only. 
like many of the answers validation I had taken and I had used in my notes also. Of course, I could not use it in the real exam, but I found the content to be reasonably good. And Karandeep sir also teaches very well, especially you know, uh, uh, things on theories also I found very useful. That I think I watched some uh, 12 hour videos on theories. His theories, all that symbolic, cognitive, he gives a very lucid structure that I found helpful. And also some, uh, like almost 70% of the damn questions I found helpful that like he talks about symbolic on religion. So it was helpful for me. I, I would not say that uh, I did not benefit from it. I did benefit from it. And all those valuation I took from uh, him and added in my notes. But by this time I was almost in my advanced stage of preparation. So I didn't, actually I did not even submit one damn answer. But uh, like I would see all the videos and I will value update my notes from it. So as I have said that like the first paper is uh, like more theoretical, more technical. You need to apply your knowledge from a theoretical standpoint. So you need a lot of uh, scholarly inputs. You need a lot of diagrams. You need a lot of facts. So this is for paper one. Then uh, you need a lot of theory, uh, theoretical inputs. Like what, like suppose some institution, uh, like incest taboo is there. What would an evolutionary uh, anthropologist say for that? What would Levi-Strauss say on that? What would structural functionalists say on that? These are theoretical inputs. Scholarly inputs are like what one author is saying. Malinowski said this about this. Malinowski said this about this. That is a scholarly input. Then you need world level examples. Like, uh, that uh, segmental lineage is found in among newer of uh, Sudan, I think. Yeah. So, like this kind of examples. So, actually, this is what is called value addition. So, you have whatever is in the basic book that you have to do, but you, it is not necessary that you do all of them in one question. At least any two of them you do in the question that actually distinguishes an answer. So, for example, uh, if a question is there on uh, let us say thick description. So this is actually a very technical concept and uh, you can mention the book he has given it in. You can mention a diagram that this is the betting ring and then bets are placed and this is simulation of the social matrix and whatever the society will be there, the same thing is reflected in this uh, uh, cockfight. For example, the weak people and the poor people, they will be sitting very far away here and here, but the rich and powerful people, they will be sitting here. and. Uh, the bettings also will be there that they will showcase the lineage. For example, there, if the lineages are like this, then all this lineage will bet on one side, all this lineage will bet on one side. And they will have bets among them, something like this, you can say. Then you can write very ca catchy phrases that, uh, uh, like uh, I think Clifford Greed said that you don't study a village, you study in a village. So he's highlighting that he, uh, it's all a contextual process. So thick discussion basically means that culture is not something like ev evolving or it's not like a static thing. It is something that is a context. For example, if I wink at someone, so if it is a wink, the meaning is deciphered in the context at which it is done. If I am winking at a boy in the playground, it is means something else from winking in the class. So all these things, if you can mention, at least two, three th uh, things you mention, definitely it will add value to your answer. And as I have already said, that uh, in paper one, uh, in the last two years, the paper one marking has been more than paper two. So kindly focus on paper one. One thing I like to say uh, is that while paper one uh, demands that more theoretical, anthropological, you have to showcase your knowledge, in paper two is slightly generic questions. So paper two, you have to write more from an uh, like a NGO to activist standpoint view. If you if you are not writing passionately about tribal problems, you are not showing that you are involved in the tribal problems. It uh, uh, appears very bookish. For example, if you simply write tribals are not getting education properly, that is not a, a correct thing to do. You should write uh, more catchily and more passionately. Like you are feeling the tribal problems, what can be actually done? So, for example, like in one of the questions on tribal displacement, so we can start in any way. But I think uh, B D Sharma once had given a report to the president, and he had, uh, and also written a letter to the president, and he highlighted some issues of the tribals. In that, he had said that a good tribal is a displaced tribal and he is ready to move out with folded hands. What this means is that like we expect a tribal that he has to give up his land easily and he must not fight the uh, uh, displacement. So whenever he makes any noise or claims for his rights, then he is treated as a nuisance and he, he is treated as a troublemaker in the society, not allowing development of the nation. So that is what he has highlighted. So if you can start with any quote, 
or you can give latest case studies such as uh, Diocha Pachami, which is in West Bengal, I think. Or you can even write Polavaram issue, such contemporary issues. Or you can write other communities from Kaka. Kaka also you have to write about one, two places, so that to show that you have read Kaka report. But uh, apart from that, two new reports have come. That is the Abhay Bhang report. This is on tribal health. And other is Idate Commission report on uh, uh, denotified tribes. So actually, all I have found that all the suggestions given in this report and this report are already there in the Kaka report. Almost 90% of them. So you can simply write the recommendations of Kaka report in the name of these both committees also. So if you actually write like this, it gives a good impression that you are reading something else apart from Kaka report also. For example, one question was there on tribal health. Tribal health. So I had written that based on Abhay Bang and my own uh, views, I suggest X, Y, Z. And you need to have technical points. For example, one of the points I have written in this answer is that we need to raise uh, expenditure on tribal health to 2447 rupees per capita so that then the tribal health will become 2.5% of GDP. So such one, this point was given in Abhay Bang report. Such kind of points, so data is required. For example, I have found that even though you're not addressing the question properly, I think it's a human psychology that the more data you put, if you put data in the answer, or you're innovating, or you're showing your naturality, or you're showing your application, even if it is not directly linked to the question, definitely you're getting, going to get good marks. So data is very essential, especially in paper two. So write passionately, put a lot of data, put a lot of examples. So you can mention about this tribes, whatever tribes are affected there, and you can put the data. So it, the answer must be very dense, is what I'm saying. You must keep a lot of content, lot of specific content, and do them. And also, one thing I'd like to say is that uh, anthropology level of anthropology increasing. So, for example, that's why you need to keep on improving. So, if you uh, my notes are very good, I don't uh, deny that. But if you just stick on my notes, then uh, maybe they might work for one or two years. But after that, definitely you need to improve on them. For example. I might have, also, for example, in functionalism, I might have done something. But that is not the end of functionalism. Right? You can think of new examples, everything at a time. Though my notes are very good on functionalism, but definitely the next person who is the next topper, he will add two, three more points to this, and that will become the new norm. So you have to keep on evolving. And the level of anthropology is uh, continuously evolving. For example, if you see Koya Shri Harsha's papers, you will distinctly find that if you write the same answers as Koya Shri Harsha did, now you will get a very less marks compared to what he did. I think he got 335. If I think if you write the same answers now, you might get 250. This is because the level of the paper has increased. But what he did at that time was actually very great because at that time such an infrastructure, such a knowledge was not aware. And that is why he got 335. But if you do the same thing now, you will get 250. So I think five to six years have passed. So one or two year relevance is there, but after that you have to innovate also. So, uh, one unique thing about uh, anthropology or option is that it is clearly mentioned in the syllabus that it is a degree level paper. That is like MS level paper, high uh, honors degree level slash masters level. So that is why you need even technical points because the professor will be setting the questions and checking your paper. And if you write uh, general layman type knowledge, he will not be impressed. But if you see in the general studies paper, it is said that any person who is reading the newspaper type can answer the question. Even though it is not in any person who can read the newspaper can answer the question, the expectation is uh, set at that level. But at uh, optional level, it is uh, assumed that you know the honors degree level. That is why it becomes, that is the, like each paper has a philosophy and thinking behind it. Then the philosophy behind option is that you have to write specific points from anthropology. And you have to show that you have an interest in anthropology. One more th unique thing I did in paper two was that, so I would write that uh, we need more anthropologists in uh, administration. So. So <laughs> that I think indirectly is telling to select me, but so we need more anthropologists in tribal administration. We need an anthropological touch in bureaucracy. So things like that. And uh, like you can always quote uh, two, three IS officers, like uh, one IS officer is called Divya in Telangana. Another IS officer is called O.P. Chaudhary. I think uh, I took this from Shubham Kumar that I mentioned him. And of course, B.D. Sharma is very famous. Then K.S. Singh is there. Just you can put these names in the answer with the work they have done. Definitely, it goods, gives a good impression to your answer. This I had taken from Shubham Kumar, I think so.
And I think one of the reasons why anthropology is uh, very high scoring in UPSC is that if you see a subject like PSIR, this is my uh, speculation, if you see a subject like PSIR and you see a subject like anthropology, this has a very strong B, uh, BS program. That means in many colleges like St. Stephen's or something, like very strong students are there and the professors are accustomed to seeing good answers. But I think that the BS program in anthropology is not very developed in India. So they might, the students there might be very casual about their approach to the subject. I'm just, uh, not all people, but some, I think majority. But in UPC, the uh, people prepare very well for anthropology. So when the professor sees our answers, I think he's more impressed and gives more marks. So this is my one speculation why anthropology gets good marks. So one thing I said that agree, again applies how to get more marks is that paper selection, uh, the question selection in paper one is very important. In paper two, since all the questions are very general, it does not matter much which question is read because the generic aspect comes in all the questions. But in anthropology, especially in paper one, you must choose, I think, maximum questions from this thing. I have said this in the previous talk, but I think this is, uh, this is the new insight I have found is that you should select maximum questions from theory, archaeology, fossils and primates. I think these three topics are especially rewarding. I think you can get 12 to 13 out of 15 also in this topic. But if some social question is the maximum you will get 9 in social and maybe 10 in physical. So couple of years ago they used to say that social questions do not attempt because it is not marking physical you choose. But I think now physical has become the new social. So what I mean by this is that if you choose a question example like what are chromosomal aberrations. I think this is a very stale kind of question because we all know that four aberrations are there. We will write the frequency of them and just write three, four features of each of them. And then we will draw one diagram about the cells that are increasing xx plus y, y, whatever is that. And then we'll write. I think this is not a good question to showcase your knowledge. If you see this compared to a question on like what is, uh, uh, what is the uh, Neolithic of Far East? Uh, Neolithic, is it Far East? Oh, sorry, it's Near East. Neolithic of Near East. So I think that this is a much better question to attempt than this kind of question. Because here you can mention uh, specific sites. You can mention about Ketel Hayuk. You can mention about Ali Kosh, Jericho, Natuf. So all these things you can mention and you can draw diagrams. So you would, I think most people would agree with me that this is conveying that you have more knowledge than simply choosing this chromosome aberration question. And I have found that whoever chose this question in this paper has not scored above 150. I have not seen one person who has chosen this question and scored one above 150 in paper one. So this is I think one insight I have found that physical also is not scoring. But it's not that all questions are very bad. Some questions of physical are also very good. Like if you see a question like macro versus micro evolution. I think this question is a good question to choose because there is a logical structure. You can draw a lot of diagrams. You can explain all the synthetic factors. You can connect them and you can have a beautiful conclusion that all uh, that uh, all evolution is micro, but over time it becomes macro evolution, especially in humans. So I think this is, some questions in social are also good, but it depends on you whether you are able to do justice. But the rule of thumb is that both of them are not very scoring unless if you get the choice, you should choose this kind of questions. So I think two unique things that I did in my uh, anthropology preparation was that uh, I had read MRM and Ember, but I hadn't read everything. So like whichever the important chapters are there. One, I'm making I'm making sort of like speculation that next year they might ask Neolithic of uh, Mesoamerica because this since last two years the question has been asked of Natufian, then the question has been asked of Near East. So the next topic in that chapter is, I think, Meso Neolithic of or farming food production in uh, Mesoamerica, that is Central America kind of region. So they might ask that. And apart from that, the boxes in anthropology, especially the use of this is that it gives a very applied knowledge of anthropology. For example, in South America, some farming system is there where they make uh, like blocks like this and then they do the farming. So something like this, they the, and then here farming is done. So this is some system of farming in South America or uh, I think Americas. So and it saves water. 
the water cons consumption is this and less. There's some specific name for this, and then some scholar has given this, and then some year is there. So if you ap apply like this, what is the knowledge of anthropology? This you will get from member and number. Also, like I mentioned in the previous slide, such questions like what are branches of anthropology? I think this is a very bad question to choose, unless you are having very specific technical knowledge from a number member such as this kind of case studies. If you simply write four branches and you give uh, the simple case studies that are found in Akshar Jain or some other book like that, you will not get very good marks. Unless you are able to get something from member and member also with unique insights that are like this. So all the boxes, I think some 50, 60, uh, sorry, 50 boxes are there but not all are relevant, only 35 to 30 are relevant. So I have uploaded on my channel, you can definitely just use them wherever you want. I had done after my second attempt, so I have not used them in the exam also. So this is one thing, boxes are there. And some important topics are there, wherever you have doubt or wherever you feel interest or you want to develop interest, you can use member number. And of course, language chapter seven is very important for member and number. And I have also made my notes and uploaded them, you can simply refer to them. I think my uh, loans on language are very comprehensive. Apart from that, one other unique thing I had done was I had done the MOTA Ministry of Tribal Affairs annual report. So this is a 100 page report and again this also I have summarized, all the key observations are there in my telegram channel. So definitely you can refer to that. Now what is the use of studying the MOTA report is that it will uh, give you a very good insight of the government schemes, what government is doing for tribals. For example, you will learn that uh, there are tribal museums being constructed, there are TRIs, tribal resource, uh, uh, research institutes which was also asked I think in 2020. Then, then you will Then you will also uh, know about something called for PVTGs. There is a conservation income development scheme that runs for five years at the state level and XYZ. Then you will also understand what is that uh, ITDP, TSP, TSS, etc. How do they function? For example, there is a difference between TSS and TSP and uh, actually TS, TSP money goes to the tribal ITDP where the projects are implemented, it's a little complex, but is there in my notes. All this will be clearly understood. Then uh, there are also schemes like uh, special central assistance to states, and there are other schemes like uh, uh, Ekalavya model residential schools. So all this data is not found in uh, anyone's notes actually. So you will only find them from this. Then one more beautiful thing is that you will get the scheme money. What is the amount of money that is for tribals? I think it is around 15,000 crores maybe, no? For MOTA. But under TSP, it is much more, I think so. And plus, if you include this uh, TSS, that is for state level, this is the union level, roughly. So plus MOTA. So then it will be much more. It will be, I think, more than 1.5 lakh crores. So this kind of data you get from there. And other insights I found was that it tells you the functioning of the, um, the entire ministry. For example, if some project has to be implemented under uh, ITDP, then the approval has to come to the uh, uh, tribal secretary, he's called TS. So, and all that kind of st uh, stuff you will get our organization. And it's a very small, it's a small, reasonably small report, 120 pages only. And I have done the summary, so you definitely can refer to that. So, I think one of the two other aspects that I highlight about anthropology is that that is the advantage of anthropology, is that there is no current. Majorly there is no current, unless suppose like Dragon Man is becoming very famous, then that also, or Nadeli Naledi. Something like that, apart from that, if it's not very famous, there's no current. I have not studied any magazine for current, or not done anything that is current. Uh, even for this attempt, my 2021 attempt, I had used data of 2019 to 20 MOTA report. I had studied the MOTA report once and I had used the data only. If I were to write exam in 2024 also, still I would use the same data. It is not penalized that you give a little uh, old data. You don't need to re remember the 2021, 22 MOTA report. And the reason for this is, this is not like a PSIR. Wherein each year the news will change and the entire notes are becoming redundant. In anthropology, once you make the notes and you have put your hard work and sweat on it, for example, if uh, Narmada man is there, you have made the notes. then there is nothing to worry about Narmada man. And if question comes five years from now also, still the same answer will prevail. So that's the beautiful thing about anthropology. Once you're done with the topic, then you don't need to worry about that. And that incremental knowledge, matlab, uh, once you keep on completing the syllabus, you'll get more confidence and do well. So there's no static com compared to PSR. And other advantage is that there is only one answer for the question. 
so in like i have explained that in sociology there is a question what are the problems of middle class this is a very open ended question and anything can be answered but in anthropology if they ask you what are chromosomal aberrations there is only one one answer for that right even though i don't like that question still answer is one only so definitely this actually so you are able to address the demand of the question that is and you can write specific points one more thing i'd like to add this is also difference between pabad and anthropology for example anudeep durisetty he had written something that after studying pabad for 5 years i still do not understand what is the question uh, examiner is asking me the question so i think there is a lot of abstraction in this kind of subject what you want so if you are a nature like engineer or you want you are like having great memorization skills or you want that there will be one answer for one question then you should uh, definitely anthropology is very good in that regard so that's why so if the nature of the subject is like this then what will the subject demand it will demand that you put lot of data and dense answer so this is the demand of anthropology hello can even just call one person so the demand of anthropology will be data and a very dense answer so if you provide that definitely you will get very good marks in anthropology और ये एक बार गिर गया था अभी चल रहा है देखिए सो आई जस्ट गिव एन एग्जाम्पल फॉर वैल्यूडेशन कैन बी डन लाइक दिस चल रहा है सो फॉर एग्जाम्पल इन सेगमेंट्री लिनियज so who studied this anyone has idea so this model of social organization was given by so the answer is uh, it is given by e v evans pritchard and in, this is found among the newer of sudan so simply what this means is that suppose some society is there it is divided like this so if suppose these both are fighting only they will fight and the rest of them will remain neutral but if this whole block is fighting it will fight with this block so there is one famous bedouin slogan that me and my uh brothers against my cousins and me and my cousins against the world so whenever some issue is there the closest group will unite so you can draw this diagram and you can also show something like this first a and this is a this is b first a and b will fight so this is x this is y so if x and y are fighting all x1 x2 x3 will unite and they will fight against y1 y2 y3 but if x1 and x2 are fighting this rest of them will remain neutral in that but if a and b are fighting all of them will combine and fight with a and b so something like this is going on so now you can add one comment here that uh, marshal sahalin has said that there is a somewhat of military aspect to this means in such society violence is very high so you need this kind of social organization to control the violence in the society he has highlighted that there is a military aspect to this social organization and he has called them as organization of predatory expansion so one more thing about anthropology said you don't need to exactly understand what the term means i i'm not exactly clear why this is applicable but uh, since marcel salen has said this definitely it acts as value addition <laughs> so definitely then you can uh, mention the book i think it's 1939 or 7 some one of the year is given the book the book name is also the newer then he has given some other concepts like maximal lineage minimal lineage all these things if you mention i think this adds a value addition to the answer
So similarly, uh, if a question is asked on uh, marriage payments, so definitely all of us will write the, that what is it called, bride price, dowry, we will write 7, 8 things in that and we will give the answer. Uh, this is definitely good, you should do all this, you should give an introduction, you should give this and then we will give examples. And then we'll give one data that I think World Ethnographic Atlas by G.P. Murdoch in 1967. So in that he has said that bride price or bride wealth is found in 60% of all society. 60% in the sense that like all Hindu community is one society. Tribal community, each society is different, right? So number will be more. And this is found in I think 10% or 20%. Which kind of society? All this is fine. This is very good thing to do. But the extra thing you can do is that you can give some theoretical dimensions. What I mean by theoretical dimensions here is that for example, one of the symbolic anthropologists, Victor Turner has said that marriage payments, they act like a symbolic currency. So this is what Victor Turner has said about marriage papers. This is a symbolic approach, you can say. Then structural functionalist Ratcliffe Brown, so has said that they are like compensation rights. So since the woman is going from one household to the other, the bride price is being paid. So if you want to ask Malinowski, what is the, your opinion on this? So he will talk about the function they serve. He will say that they cement the relation between the groups. They help in orderly exchange of marriage. And it is expression of social status in the sense that if you give more a bride price, then you are more status in the society, all those things he will say. Actually, for this for this thing, you don't need, need any knowledge. You can simply think about what Malinowski from a functionalist perspective would say on bride price. The functions he would list down. So simply that would be the functionalist perspective. Then uh, other scholars like Structuralist like uh, R. F. Nadal and Levi Strauss, they would say that there is sort of reciprocity being between the groups. For example, uh, bride price is a compensation for the bride. So, if you see from that uh, economic standpoint, it is an example of uh, balanced reciprocity, isn't it? That something is going here and the bride is coming here. So, there is an equal exchange at the individual level. So, it is, you can say it is an example of balanced re reciprocity. So, as you can see that instead of restricting marriage payments to only marriage payments, we have even brought in economic anthropology here. And this kind of thing, after you write the six types of marriage payments, if you write this kind of things, so let us say this is your answer, three pages are there, till here you write this thing. So finally then you can write theoretical dimensions, then like one chart, one, two, three, four, five, six, then contemporary relevance, what type of marriage payments are being followed. I think this will give a good marks for you. Then if you can give two, three examples, like that in Africa, that swords are there, uh, used as marriage payments, means that same sword will keep on rotating on different people and that is how the marriage payments are done. So if one marriage breaks down, then the entire cycle of marriages will be at risk. So that is why there is a big taboo against uh, divorce and all that you can mention. So as you can see in my first two pages notes, all type of marriage payments are there and then Based on validation, I have added theoretical perspectives and then this is done. So I think I'll do one more example. So uh, we study about political organization, right? In political anthropology, we study about political organization. So, what is that called? Uh, from band to tribe to chiefdom to state. So, this is the general evolution of political organization. So, there are some, you can go a little step further and you can even talk about the theories of evolution of political organization, how political organization actually started. So, 
If you were to ask Victor Gordon Child, how did it start? Then he said there are four or five revolutions that have shaped mankind and one of them is the urban revolution. If you see, if you study the theories of Victor Gordon Child, he has given agricultural revolution, industrial revolution, those three, four revolutions he has mentioned and one of them is the urban revolution. So because of that, this political organization has come, he would say. And it is called the voluntary theory. Means that people are doing it voluntarily. Apart from that, there is a circumscription theory by Robert Carniero. Robert So, uh, this is actually a very interesting theory. What he has said, so if population increases, there will be warfare and th then state will develop. And that generally when warfare happens, it leads to dispersion of the population. So, if pe more people are there, they will be fighting among each other. And, uh, if the warfare is happening, then people will disperse and that can lead to state formation theory. So, the thing is that if you see the Amazon, this is South America, right? You see this Amazon region. If there is a, a population increase here and warfare is happening, people will easily disperse. So, here state will not form because the concentration needed for state formation is not there. But if you see this Andy region, here the Andes mountains are blocking it, right? So if here population increases, there will be warfare and the state will come because here their dispersion is not possible. So something like this, I said that where state will form and where state will not form. So this is called circumscription theory and I think it's a very interesting concept. Then he has given all the three, but the basic idea is this, why uh, city states are, are forming here, but not here. So, like if you bring, bring such insights, this is a very novel insight, right? So, if you can add one or two points like this. Like I said, you don't need to do five or six for each answer. If you do one or two, you, uh, if you do, if you do one or two unique things also, that is more than enough. I think one more, one other point is that given by L.H. Morgan, he has said that society evolved from kinship based to territory based. I think this is called uh, societus to civitas. So, such things also you can add here, basic things also about theory you can add here. So, I think I have highlighted how to do this thing. And uh, you can add the validation on your own also. And uh, so generally, I have mentioned that theories, archaeology, fossils are very important. And uh, I have mentioned many things on my Telegram channel. Plus, I have given uh, one more talk at L2A. Actually, I have gone into the uh, detail about how to do all the theories that all I have done there. So there is no point repeating that. Only the things which I find is relevant, which need, which need uh, repetition or re-emphasizing, I have done. And the things that I have not talked there, like uh, this state conception theory, I have not talked there. So that's why I spoke about in this talk. Now, like uh, I'm willing to take any questions you have. Right. So this would be the end of my formal talk. Now you can ask me questions. So the question is like how to make the notes, right? how to compile the notes. So compiling notes I think is the major challenge in anthropology because there is no one book or books repetition is there, a lot of time taking is there. So I think one topper I think two, three years back I think his name was Vivek Bhasmi or someone else, some uh, topper of anthropology. He has said that he had read all the books for anthropology and uh, he had found that almost all books have same content. Almost all books have similar content. So you choose any one book. So first thing you should do is any 
one, anyone in the world, it may not be this book or that book or Akshay Jain or uh, Vivek Bhasmi, it can be any book in the world. You do the topic once, whatever the basic thing is there in the book. For example, if you study marriage payments, any book you will find 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 marriage payments are written. So if you complete that properly and make your notes on this, this is the first level. Then ideally you should search for examples, case studies or thinkers, etc. in the second level. Once you get uh, three or four unique points for each answer, like for marriage payments, if you get three or four unique aspects, unique dimensions about this topic, marriage payments, then simply add them like one, two, three, four. This should be your validation. Then at the third level, you should see whether the content you have gotten is enough for the answer or not. So suppose it's a 10 marker answer. And this content already you have gotten which is validated and the structure is there in the answer. It's already coming till here. Then you hardly need one or two points. So one thing I've noticed is that in anthology, people get carried away. In this uh, cycle of value addition, which keeps on going, they never know how to stop at which stage. So instead of going too much, just uh, evaluate how much content you have. For example, uh, my content on, I think, Upper Paleolithic is more than thrice what is required for writing an answer. So actually, there's not much use for this because I will not be able to write in the exam. So once you do these two steps, then this third step, you can just evaluate how much content you have, whether you need two or three more points. Or one more thing you can do after doing all this, you can see, actually, the best thing you can do to get these two or three points, you can see some topper notes. Definitely one or two points will be there in the topper notes and you can add that. Then after that you can see some test copies. Or you have seen some discussion videos of your uh, uh, faculty. He has also given two, three videos. So then also you can add from that. So validation, once you get two pages content and you have enough validation. Uh, if you stop at this stage, then you will get a 230 kind of score. If you do this stage, you might get 270. But if you uh, keep it more dense, then definitely you'll get 280 plus. So uh, you can do any book. But uh, ensure that these three stages are, are done. Yeah. So uh, you are asking whether we need to make notes from class notes. So like I, I think that if you if you have class notes, I think that is the best thing you can have. Because they will be very precise, very exact, and a lot of content and measurement will be already there. So you know you, uh, especially you don't need to convert this into question and answer format. Like I have followed question and answer format, but I never wrote like what is this question, what is this answer? It was like a semi question answer format. Like I will write upper paleolithic and all the things about upper paleolithic will come here. So if a question is asked, I can immediately reshuffle the things in the content and write my answer. So if something like is there, like for example, let us say in your class notes, symbolic theory is there. And all the things are there mentioned like this. Then you do not need to waste time on structuring it in a question answer format exactly how you'll write it. Because all the content is there, definitely you can do it in the exam also. And it is very easy, easy to do. So if a content is like if you are able to remember the content very crystal clearly, there is no need to make it in question answer format. It's okay, you can need question, you can ask. No. Yeah. You in offline, you mean how, how to okay? So, like if you see my notes that I have written on Telegram, uh, you will find a lot of blank spaces. In my notes, especially, there are like one point will be there on this page, and then the entire page will be blank. That is actually for updating the notes only. And that is one of the reasons why my notes have become little haphazard. That, uh, like, first I wrote some answer here, then I found two value additions. So, this page was blank, so I'll write here one, two points. So, actually, while referring this page, you have to refer this page also. So, like that is my notes have become. But uh, I generally leave a lot of wi white spaces. For example, if I have done diffusionism, then I will leave two pages and then start uh, functionalism. This is how I used to do. But it doesn't matter if you, can, if you can understand your notes, that's the best thing. I can understand all of my notes. And one more thing I would do is that I would, I would write a lot of short forms. Like I would write PO for political organization, PUM for psyche unity of mankind. This would be social. This should be social structure. This should be cultural. This should be culture. This should be anthropology. This should be anthropologist. This should be political science, something like this. So I used to use a lot of short formula. I would not write main thing. So if something like development, uh, diffusionism, I would write like this, diffusionism. 
So that would make my notes little smaller and not repetitive. So like you are going to start or have already started? You have not decided yet. So when is the first attempt? Okay. So I think that uh, so like I think that uh, you should keep in mind that it'll at least take six months to get two eighty plus. This is the first point you need to keep in mind. And second thing you must keep in mind is that whether your temperament temperament is suitable for anthropology. This I think is very important. If I were to take sociology, I would not get good marks. But if some sociology person would take anthropology who is very creative minded, who is like very good at English, he has command over English, then I think he would not get good marks in anthropology. So whether your temperament is choosing is most important. But it takes six months and your temperament. I think these are the two things. And marks, I think definitely anthropology is one of the best subjects now. Marks definitely I think is very good. So it depends on you. These two questions you have to answer. Yeah, that's the second question, right? Yeah. So I found that it is not much significant biotech part. It definitely requires some knowledge of uh, allele, gene, all that required is there. But that is only a very sus specific segment. Only from 9.1 to I think uh, 9.8 is the biotech part, little bit plus 1.4. So I think this is less than 10% of the syllabus. So it is not significant much. If you can see the basic videos on YouTube about cell structure, DNA replication. I, th I found that many people are not clear about this gene and allele, how does it function, what is the ribosome, how does the transcription occur, what is the cell, what happens. I think many people are not clear about that, how do enzymes function, what proteins function. If you can watch 15-20 uh, videos on that on YouTube, all are available online. Then it, this base, once the cell structure is clear, then all these things will follow. For example, uh, I think uh, mo many people confuse between mitosis and meiosis. Like how do these things line up in that phase, uh, P, M, I think it's enough, uh, metaphase. So how do these things align up? How do they segregate? A lot of this will affect uh, how the entire biology is operating. Then how does recombination work like this? How does this happen? What is the rate of recombination? All that. If your cell structure is clear, it is uh, possible to do. I think if you are having little doubt in that, uh, one source is there, which I actually studied a little while back. It is uh, Eric Lander of MIT. So he explains in a very nice way about this cell structure, how DNA replication works, what is recombination, so actually Mendel's second law that uh, independent assortment takes place is not correct and uh, recombination also is not completely correct. So it is somewhat 50-50 between them and I'll explain why it is like that. So if you are a uh, little weak in that, it definitely can refer it. And other unique aspect that I referred to was that uh, like D.K. Bhattacharya is the father of Indian archaeology. So he has done on EPG Patshala. He has given some 30 videos. All this validation I've already done in my notes. So if you don't want to watch, you can not watch. But I think his videos are, were very good in uh, archaeology. And it's very specific. So for example, he will go into so much specific, like if it's a Levalois technique, he will tell you that this is the flake, and the angle of scar of detachment will be 90 degrees in the level of flake. He will give such much detail. And if you write this kind of points, and then uh, definitely we get very high marks. So this is what I can say. Yeah, ask. So uh, the reasons for choosing anthropology, I have mentioned first is that uh, it's a demand is known. Firstly, the f mo for me, most important is scoring. Uh, like since there are more than 20 subjects, nobody has interest in all the subjects. So first for me, is scoring. If the scoring is not good, I have not have chosen anthropology, irrespective of the other facts. So I think Koyashi Arsa once said that I do not care about anthropology. I only care about the marks I get from anthropology. But uh, definitely, if you have interest in anthropology, you score better. But uh, scoring should be the primary criteria. Then demand is there. Then uh, I think compared to mathematics, the syllabus is less. Mathematics takes one year plus. Compared to mathematics, syllabus might be less. But in general, it takes six months plus. So that is one reason. Apart from that, uh, it suits my temperament. That memorization is there. Uh, most of the work is before the exam. Note making, I'm good at. So all my notes are made on offline medium only. So all these factors you can see as exos anthropology. I give much more detail why, dif why different from PSI, why different from sociology already. Hmm. Yeah. Sir, uh, what is the use of it as anthropology? We are learning anthropology. So, what are the applications? So first important is that it will make you an IS officer or IPS officer. That I think is the most important importance for you. But uh, other, other aspect of impulse, it it tells you about human differences. 
I think it's very unique aspect of our anthropology. So, uh, like in our world, what is different from us, we find it is the wrong thing. We are doing the right thing. So when you are exposed to human differences, then uh, definitely it makes you a better person and uh, helps you appreciate diversity. And since in the IAS, like we can be posted anywhere and also the diversity is very high in our country. So definitely it will help you. Other aspect is that, um, like it will make you aware of some problems that are not commonly known. For example, in our country there are something called the denotified tribes, whose population I think according to data commission is around 10 crore. But they neither come in the SC list, ST list or OBC list. So before my paper I was not aware of this. I think most people are not aware of this. So such kind of problems, and 10 crore is not a small population. It is more, I think more than the scheduled type population also, or around that. So such problems you are aware of. And uh, you can learn about Indian social structure caste. But I think these are the primary reasons you can study. That is the good thing about anthropology. But primary reason is uh, for getting marks. These are all like, you can become a good human by studying sociology also. There is no issue with that. But marking is the most, uh, becoming IAS officer I think is the most important reason for choosing anthropology. So, uh, if language is simple, simple language is always appreciated. Nobody likes uh, someone who is not uh, able to read your answer or it's very complex. Simple language, if you, some complex theory is there. For example, if suppose uh, universalization and parochialization are there. These are simple concepts, but if you can explain them simple language by di diagram or some simple statements, definitely that is appreciated. The complexity comes not in the language you use, like the complex jargons you use. But how you are able to insert the theoretical dimensions in simple points. For example, I generally don't understand what the uh, Levi-Strauss said. It's very complex to understand what Levi-Strauss said. But if in simple language you can say that he thinks the world in terms of binary opposite. For him, everything is either black or white. Something like this we can explain. This is actually appreciated because you're condensing the theory. For example, uh, in the study of myth, he has studied that you should study the myths you should break the myth into mythemes like this, then you can go in this direction. This is actually very complex. If you can explain this in simple words, that is appreciated. So simplicity is there for conveying complex, complex concepts. The more you simplify, the more marks you will get. If he does not understand, you will not get any marks. But uh, that being said, some phrases have their uh, impact. Few phrases if you can put, like about Balinese cockfight, he said it is a simulation of social matrix. This is actually a complex statement, but occasionally you can put one or two statements like this. Okay. So firstly, if you have done your classroom coaching, I think that you are very reasonably placed now because these notes are very important. Firstly, you should uh, focus on them. And I think you can join test series now only because, especially join part test series because like 1.1 to 1.4 is there. You will have one week time for this, right? So in this one week, study your classroom notes. Then study, P uh, one more thing I mentioned, PYQ from 2013 to 22. This should be the memorized in your hand, head because uh, once I mentioned that 18, 19, 20, all three years that uh, ecological anthropology, that stale question has been asked, what is the adaptation, all that. So you might think that it should not be asked, but it is asked because the paper setter is in the mental mindset to ask the same question again because he has seen the past year papers. So this, at, this thing is definitely, if you can see even more behind, but it's good, but at least this much you do. Okay, these questions are definitely repeated. For example, Balinese Cockpit was asked before. So like once the test is coming, for example, this. So let us say this one week you have. In this one week test, you can see PYQs. Check if you have covered all syllabus. Many times you don't cover all syllabus. Check Vivek Bhasme and Akshar Jain. Actually, this will not take more than 20 minutes, generally for small chapters. If you have already done your class notes and have good notes, then Akshar Jain's notes will not take more than 20, 25 minutes. For example, you get two, three points. You get this many points. Simply add them here. Then uh, you see two or three topper copies. Then after the test, you see the test discussion. If you do this for the syllabus once, that means for entire syllabus from 1.1 back to 1.1, if you have done this, then you are almost having very good notes. 
And uh, before your mains exam, again, if you do the same thing, that would be the second validation, right? By that time, it's more than enough, I think so. So actually, there is no secret only. So I think, like uh, where the ICS material I had referred a lot, Akshat Jain had referred a lot, Koya Sri Harsha's notes I had referred a lot, I had referred Mandar Jain Patki's notes a lot, uh, Kaka report I had referred, the number and number I had referred, and he has written on book also, like uh, some book is there on social and cultural that I had read completely. This, this entire thing had completed Akshar Jain's book. This, I think, is the most important base. Then Mota report I had read. I think even Abhay Bang report I had read most of it. And even Itate I had read. But it's not necessary to read all this. The, the things are there already in my notes. And then what are the other standard books? No, I had not read that for. Like, uh, yeah, then I had read uh, DK Bhattacharya for uh, archaeology. Lot of Googling I had done for fossils. Lot of Googling I had done. And uh, like, uh, search every video I had watched. Like, some 30 videos are there. And those are very highly value added and very concise. So, that 30 videos I had watched many times. So, like this only, all the common sources only. And uh, I think two, three standard books also I had read. I think Tribal India by Nadeem Hasnan. Two books are there. And uh, one more was Indian. Uh, uh, Indian Society by Nadeem Hasan also one book is there, one famous one, Indian, uh, Indian Anthropology, that one also. So I can see uh, standard books are only three, four, but other valuations are heavy. And many topper copies I had referred. I think I had referred uh, Lakshmi and topper copy, Akshat Jain, Sachin Gupta, almost all topper copies I had referred. So you have condensed all this into your own? Means I try to, not that every topic I have taken from everywhere, but I have tried to do something like that, you can say, yeah. So, I think in my first interview, they asked me why you have uh, taken anthropology. They asked that question. Second interview, no question was asked. But it's very easy to say. You can say that, sir, uh, I went through the entire list of options offered by UPSC and then narrowed down to two, three things, sociology, anthropology, uh, philosophy. But in that, my strength is in memorization. I can give a definite answer. You can say this and say, that's why I took anthropology. And it's very scoring paper. So that's why I took it. You can mention scoring also. Hmm. So, I think it depends on uh, where you are. So, if you are just beginning your preparation, I think you should actually start with uh, optional preparation first. It's not necessary, but you should do optional preparation first. Before the prelims, you should be at least thorough with your optional. Otherwise, it becomes tough to get a seat. But it becomes, but uh, managing optional and GS is actually a little bit tough only. Especially if you are doing that uh, classroom coaching, it becomes very tough because it, it takes at least, I think, 6 hours of this and 5 hours of this. So, 11 hours, I don't think many people study actually 11 hours. So, ideally, when you are doing optional, very uh, focused on optional, at least that should take 70 percent of your time. When you are focused on optional, at least give 70 percent of your time. When you are doing uh, like very intense value addition and try to keep very light thing on GS. Like, uh, this is possible that you might do very heavy optional, optional reading you are doing very heavily and then if you are getting bored, you might read spectrum from history. So, like simple, the other aspect, one of them should be simple. Like, if this is complex, you are referring 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 books here and compiling the material. Then try to keep the other subjects simple that only you are keep on reading one chapter, one chapter every day. Something like this you can do. But then if you are also doing here, uh, you are doing ethics, then you are doing essay, then you are doing uh, this thing, that thing, then it becomes tough to keep track of anything. So, I think that uh, if you study 8 hours a day, the rest 8 hours a day you can do whatever you want, there is no restriction. But even studying 8 hours a day is a little tricky over the long term. So, try to study 8 hours a day and the rest rest 8 hours are your own, uh, you can do anything you want and the 8 hours for sleeping. And I had no schedule, I used to do whatever I feel like. Mostly I used to do anthropology only. 
like uh, for my second attempt, I think I did almost eight to nine months of only anthropology. I think that gave me good marks because my approach was that I should get good marks in anthropology and that will get me a score. My score in GS, I think, is uh, like uh, it's good, but it's pretty moderate. It's four zero one out of one thousand. So I'll just write this again. So I think that uh, IAS level score is four hundred and ten plus. My score in GS was I think four hundred and one. Last year it was three seventy seven. So I did not work on GS much, but still it improved. I think due to overall knowledge improvement. And I think highest in GS four is four eighty four. I think so. The first ranker has got this, and uh, I think second highest is maybe four fifty five. So you can see the toppers are getting very marks because they are focusing on GS, and those who get GS plus option, both they are good at. They get I think top ten rank. But uh, if you get four ten plus also in GS, it's very important. It's especially very tough to do this from to go from here to here, because here each mark you need much more effort to be put in. Compare, I think going from two forty to two eighty in anthropology is much easier than going from four ten to four fifteen in GS. Hmm, which one? So I think first paper you should not feel worried. The major reason for taking time, I have found, is that you are not not remembering the notes. So if you don't remember your notes, then it is going to take a lot of time, especially in some questions. Like I have found that the moment you, for example, in GS paper, especially GS paper, the moment you stop and you. I got very good marks in GS4 actually. I got 114 out of 250, which is a very good decent score. Last year also I had got 101 out of 250, which is also a decent score. So GS4, I can say that if you are stopping and thinking, then you are losing time. Ideally, you should have a lot of buffer points such that you are, if you are writing this point, you can think the next point immediately, yeah. and you are uh, memorizing certain flowcharts such that immediately you can uh, drop one two flowcharts here, examples all that. So in anthropology also, if you are not remembering, you are going to take more time. So and this is more important because there are hardly any new questions. Hardly any new questions are there. All the questions are mostly known only. 80% of the paper is there, so it should not take time. One more unique thing about optional paper is that you have 20 markers. I think these are the easiest questions in the world to attempt if you know the answer, because in 20 markers. Uh, so I'll just write this clearly, I guess. So like uh, 10 marker, you have seven minutes. 15 marker, you have 10 minutes. Uh, what is that? Twenty marker you have. How many minutes? It's fourteen minutes. So this is four pages. This is three pages. This is two pages. So filling four pages in fourteen minutes is not actually very tough. It's very easy. Suppose you you think about something. Still here you have taken four minutes. But once you get the flow, you can easily fill this in the next three minutes. So. It is very easy to complete twenty markers, and whenever I was in time pressure, I would start on twenty markers because I can easily pull uh, one or two minutes from here. If you add this thing all up, it comes to actually one eighty-four minutes, I think so. Sorry, one seventy-four out of one eighty. So the six minutes it takes for deciding the question. So do not get stuck on any question because there is no scope for error. All questions are equally important, right? So you have to like. This, this is the exact watch I used for my mains examination, and in that I can clearly see that the time is 1:30:23. So even use a watch that has the seconds because it helps you in time management. And suppose 1:30, I think I'll explain about GS also, which I found useful. So GS marks you have 10 markers, which are 10, and 20, uh, 15 markers, right? 15 markers that are 15. So I used to give seven minutes. And ten minutes. How much is that? This is seventy minutes. This is hundred minutes. So one seventy. Optional, you get little less squeeze, but here is one seventy minutes. Ideally, you should take if you are doing ten minutes for each. The appropriate time you are doing for each question, this is the time you should take. So I have a balance of ten minutes. This is like my buffer. So what I would do is that, like many questions, I would finish in ten minutes or seven minutes. There is no issue there. I have buffer. But some questions which I know very well, like I want to put some more impression. In these three pages of 10-15 marker, I want to put more information. Then I would pre-decide that two minutes extra I would give to this question. So then I would write that extra thing or very nicely. Some questions, what would happen is that uh, I would 
take 9 minutes for this 10 marker, let us say. Instead of 7 minutes, I took 9 minutes. So then the buffer 10 minus 2 is 8. So now only I have 8 minutes to do the rest of the things. So I have found out on almost all the papers, this, this 10 minutes buffer was there, almost it was eaten by everything by the time I had paper. Either by doing this extra validation or by due to falling behind in some question. But what something, sometimes what used to happen was that, is that I am writing this answer. I am somewhere here. Okay, I am somewhere here. And already 9 minutes have taken place. Now I know if I take too much time, then the buffer will go down. So immediately I used to write some conclusion very fast and just end it like this. So this would be conclusion. And this would be, I just cancel this out like this. Not like this, I would not cancel. So like this and like this I would cancel. So let us say it took 9.5 minutes. So it is for 10 markers. That is 2.5 minutes over the limit. So 10 minus 2.5, 7.5. And the way I used to keep track is that, like this is a number that you can actually keep track of. This 10 minus 9, 7, 8. How much buffer is remaining? So let us say I start at 9 o'clock the paper. So how much buffer is remaining? 10 minutes. I end my first 10 marker at uh, 9.08. So how much buffer is remaining? 9 minutes, right? Because I have used 1 minute extra for 10 marker. So 9 minutes of buffer is remaining. So then when I used to start, uh, let, now let us say after 1 10 marker, I have attempted 15 marker. So when should I complete the 15 marker by? 9.18. So I will just explain this again. So let us say I start the paper at 9. First I attempt 10 marker. Ideally when should I complete this by? 9.7, right? 9.7 I should complete this by. But let us say I complete it by 9.8. So what is the buffer remaining now? Nine. 9 minutes. So this number is very easy to keep track of. So now let us say I, at 9.08, because I have completed 9.08, right? Then I attempt 15 marker. Ideally, when this should be completed by? 9.18, because 15 marker is 10 minutes. So 9.18 I should complete by. So if I completed by 9.18 only, then what is the buffer still remaining? 9 minutes. But if I completed at 9. 17, what would happen? So then buffer would become back to 10 minutes because I gained 1 minute in this question. But if I completed 9.19, then again buffer would become 8 minutes. So something like this I used to do. I used to keep track of this in the, I, in almost all the, all the papers I, I kept track of this. Especially in ethics paper, it's very tough to complete. I used to strictly follow 1.3 hours for this, 1.3 hours for the 10 marker. Because case, I found that even the 10 markers are very rewarding. And I did 10 markers as well. That's why I got 114 in GS ethics paper. Hmm. In the optional? So I can generally say that don't choose 10 markers first. Because they are actually sometimes tough questions are very tough in 10 markers. We don't know what is happening. Then you have to condense the question and write properly. And you have to link the question. So it, it is a little tough to write 10 marker. So I would ideally start with 15 marker or 20 marker. And many times what, I would, what would happen is that I would write one 10 marker, then go to the next 10 marker, then go to the next 10 marker. 20 marker, sorry. All 20 markers I would attempt first and then 15 markers. Because time management is easy in 20 markers. Right, right. So I think that that analysis is slightly overrated. It's just like you can see what is happening. So like uh, I would write the question number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 till 100. Then name of the question like uh, playwrights. Like this I would name each of the questions. Then I would see whether I'm getting correct or incorrect roughly, okay? Getting a correct or incorrect. Then I would uh, give a tag that is this an easy question or a medium question or tough question. I would give the tag. So from here you can see how many questions are easy, medium, tough. You will get this graph. Then you can see which I would personally say uh, whether the, which subject question is this. So I would have six subjects economy, polity, history, uh, environment, agriculture, and current. So I would personally assign my tag whether I feel that if some question is, for example, say, let us say 1919 Act, Montague Kelson. For me, it is a polity question because I have read 1919 Act from the Lakshmi Khan book, not from Spectrum book. Spectrum also it is there. But so that would categorize this. So then you can say this is easy, medium, tough, right? Then you can say, for example, polity. Easy, medium, tough, this many questions were there. Let us say. And I say I found that all the tough questions in polity I got wrong. 
that is not a reason to worry because easy and medium is tough. So like that, you say, like when I did easy, medium, tough questions, I found that this year 50 questions were easy, uh, tough, 10 questions were medium and 40 questions were easy. So what are the easy and medium questions to combine? 50. So I found that I got 46 or 45 correct out of them. Only 4 or 5 made mistake and 1 or 2 I left. So it's not, not every easy question is easy to do, right? So all my mistakes were in the tough questions. So this gives you that you are on the right track. So you can see that all either questions are tough or questions are easy or medium. I'm just giving roughly, okay? So this kind of analysis you can do. Then uh, one step further you can go is that where is the question source come from? So if you see that there is some book that you find that is being asked or some newspaper is there or what is the source of the question? So the major idea of the question is that it will help you go through the entire paper and see what is happening. It is not predictive that if, if such thing happens like this, this year, next year it will happen, that is not the case. But it gives you overall idea and I did it for all the two years I attempted. Yeah, so if you get tough questions wrong, it's not an issue. For example, I did this analysis this year. So there were 13 history questions. And I think so almost 11 of them were tough. And two were easy. So you can see whether, whether if you are getting these two right and not getting any of this, it's not much of an issue. So the thing is that I should not do this for anyone. They, everyone should do it for themselves. Then only you will go through, Acha, this like this, okay. So let us say, then I would calculate what is my strike rate in each of the subjects. For example, uh, I found that in generally uh, economy, my strike rate would be around 80%. In uh, art and culture, it would be around 40%. So this is my strong service, this is my weak service, something like that. You don't need to do this for all papers. Just for prelims paper, if you do, it's enough. Uh, and you did this analysis uh, before completing the after? After giving the prelims exam. Yes. Hmm. After I came back from home, put match the key, then I would do this. Yeah, so for I think for uh, economy, I had relied on Brunal sirs and I was a big fan of him. So Brunal had completed and I not even touched anything else for economy. I think that even that NCRT, if you do his course, there is no need to do NCRT also. I found that. For economy, this was my only source. Nothing, I didn't do an anything else in economy. And uh, my scores in economy were generally good, very good, for especially in prelims. This repo rate, all that game, I, I understand really well. And for what did you say, second one? Art and culture is slightly tricky one. You should do that 11th class fine arts NCRT. Then I had read Nitin Singhania also a little bit. Especially important chapters. Like the way I had approached Nitin Singhania was that there are I think some 30 chapters let us say. I found out hardly 8 chapters are important in that. That arts and culture, that symbols, all that is not important. You just check after each chapter how many PYQ have been asked. If at least two PYQ has been asked, you do the chapter or skip the chapter. For example, in this Nitin Singh, a few things are explained nicely. That architecture chapter is there, right, initially. That uh, stupa is there, this thing is there, that thing is there. That is chapter is important. But uh, like puppetry is not an important chapter. Martial arts is not an important chapter. Like that you can see. So hardly I think eight chapters are important in Nitin Singh, Eight to ten. Yes, in the economy section, I have this So I cannot do that comparison because I have not read Sriram's booklet. I can tell about Brunal if you want. I found it nice. So I can't compare with anyone. I can tell you what th this person has done. Like I think my whole preparation has been influenced by Brunal. So I, miss my t I found that his teaching style of joking and telling jokes and all that, I found it nice. Many people don't like it, so it's your personal choice. But I found it very nice and I think it affected my whole preparation. But I can't compare with this book or that book when I have not read the second book. So anyone wants to ask any other question? So shall we end the session? Okay, thank you very much. Just can anyone call that person there? I hope you found the session useful. <laughs> thank you. Even we discussed a little bit of GS right in the end, yeah. So all of you uh, join my Telegram channel, right? Because I will get subscribers and I will get motivation.
So this is the Telegram channel. Narayan Amit underscore AR70 underscore CSE2020.